Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, uh, Ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia to the Kingdom of the Netherlands, His Excellency Ambassador Maifat, Secretary General of ASEAN, uh, His Excellency Datuk Bin Chokhoi, Excellency Speakers and Distinguished uh, Discussants, Excellencies, Distinguished Participants, Ladies and Gentlemen. Welcome to the webinar, The Netherlands Accession to the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation in Southeast Asia, Future View on ASEAN the Netherlands Relations, held today, 18 February 2021. My name is Yuda Firmanto from the Embassy of the Republic of Indonesia to the Kingdom of the Netherlands. I will be the MC for today. Uh, allow me to read today's program. Firstly, opening remark by His Excellency Ambassador Roy Pass, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of the Republic of Indonesia to the Kingdom of the Netherlands, as the Chair of the ASEAN Committee in The Hague, ACTH. Next, we have video message from His Excellency Steph Block, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, followed by keynote speech by His Excellency Datuk Lim Jokhoi, the ASEAN Secretary General. We then will begin the speakers and discussion sessions, which will be followed by questions and answer session. The moderator for this session is Dr. Muhammad Norisham bin Muhammad Yusof, the Sasi Date of the Embassy of Malaysia to the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Before we start, I would like to inform our participants that throughout the event, we will send you attendance list in the chat box. It is imperative that you fill it correctly. Without further ado, I now give the floor to His Excellency Ambassador Mayapas for his opening remarks. Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you. Morning. <clears throat> The Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, His Excellency Steph Block, Secretary General of Asia, His Excellency Dato Im Chok Hoi, Director of Asia and Oceania, the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Her Excellency Karin Mosen Lechner, the Ambassador of the Kingdom of the Thailand of Thailand to the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Her Excellency Ambassador Exidi Pintarucci, Pintarucci, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, on behalf of the ASEAN Committee in The Hague, I would like to extend my appreciation to Excellencies, speakers and discussants, and distinguished participants for joining us today. It is it gives us a positive outlook that in the middle of this prolonged pandemic, we are all still hungry for new knowledge and information, particularly regarding ASEAN and the Netherlands relations. I am happy to inform you that this webinar has registered around 480 participants, including our special participant, uh, our neighbor, Ambassador Matthew, our neighbor in ASEAN and here. Thank you, Ambassador, for joining us this morning. The year of 2020 signifies another milestone for the relations between ASEAN and the Netherlands. With the approval of the Netherlands ESC accession at the 37 ASEAN Summit, and related summit in November 2020, the Netherlands set to become the third European country to exit the, to the TSE. We in ASEAN, and especially the ASEAN Committee in The Hague, enthusiastically welcome this significant development. The Netherlands has proven track record on, of delivery on peace, justice and security at the global level. The Netherlands has also been an ardent supporter of multilateralism-based global order, equally important 
the Netherlands is also one of EU's powerhouses. With such a strong credential, the Netherlands can undoubtedly be a sound partner in fostering perpetual peace and strengthening multilateralism-based cooperation that would further pave the way toward security and prosperity for all. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, the TAC has served and thrived as a code of conduct in ASEAN and ASEAN external relations. As a potential high contracting partners to the TSC, we expect the Netherlands to uphold the principle in Einstein in the TSC, such as peaceful settlement of dispute, renouncing the threat of use of force, and promoting rule of law. We also expect the Netherlands to embrace the principle Einstein in the TSC, which include ASEAN centrality, mutual respect, trust, and benefit. Moreover, amidst the continuing rivalries and trust deficit, especially in the wider regional surrounding of ASEAN, we hope the Netherlands accession to TSC would contribute meaningfully to the concerted effort toward perpetual peace, offer lasting prosperity, and result-oriented cooperation. On the other side, I think it is not exaggeration to re-emphasize that a peaceful and prosperous Southeast Asia and its wider regional surroundings are of pertinent interest of ASEAN countries only, but also of the Netherlands and the EU. The EU is one of the main investors and development partners in the region, with approximately 90 billion in annual investment while the Netherlands is one of EU biggest investor and trading nations. Excellencies, distinguished participants, the Netherlands accession to TSC should not and will not be an end in itself. Rather, it is a beginning of a scale up dialogue and intensified collaboration between ASEAN and the Netherlands for peace, stability, and prosperity, including regional surrounding of Asia. This webinar is organized by the ASEAN Committee in The Hague as a token of appreciation to the Netherlands for its accession to the TSC. Through this webinar, we aim to facilitate a dialogue on the recent data and project way forward for ASEAN and the Netherlands after this important milestone. For us in ASEAN, we hope to learn from the Dutch side about their aspiration of becoming a high contracting party to the TSC and added value they will bring to the table. On the other side, I believe it would be beneficial for Dutch side to understand the expectation of ASEAN to its high contracting partners. Most importantly, both ASEAN and the Netherlands need to scale up their effort to bring the relations between the two to the new level, including through the framework of the ASEAN outlook of Indo-Pacific. The timing of the webinar could not more impeccable. Both ASEAN and the Netherlands have launched their Indo-Pacific outlook or guidelines. ASEAN and the Netherlands could, in this regard, further explore all possibilities avenues to vision Indo-Pacific region as a theater of cooperation and not the theater of competition or rivalry. Excellencies, distinguished participants. We are happy to inform you that this seminar will highlight a video message by the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, His Excellency State Block, and will feature a keynote speech from the Secretary General of ASEAN, 
His Excellency Dato Lim Chok Hoi. The webinar also invite an excellent speaker from the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which is represented by Director of Asia and Oceania, Her Excellency Karin Mosen Lechner. We are also honored to have my good friend as a, a speaker to the webinar, the Ambassador of the Kingdom of Thailand to the Kingdom of Netherlands, Her Excellency Exiri Pintaruchi. Moreover, to widen our knowledge and to spark our discussion, we have two knowledgeable discussion with us today. Dr. Safi, Safiyah Muhibat from the Center of, of Strategic and International Studies, CIS Indonesia, and also Professor Ronald Holzhacker of University of Groningen. With this, Highlight on behalf of ASEAN Committee in the head. Please allow me to express once again my highest appreciation to the speakers' discussion for their presence today. I would also like to highlight the continued support of the, the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs for this seminar and our work in general. Special thanks also go to all participants, 40, 480 people that have availed themselves to participate in our event today. I wish you all a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Terima kasih. Thank you, Excellency Ambassador. Next up, we have a video meeting session that will be conducted from this excellency staff block the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. The video will be played shortly. Please have it. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure and a privilege to speak to you today. In Southeast Asia, you play a sport that is quite unheard of in the Netherlands. Sepak Tako, <laughs> the sport that makes the volleyball that I know look easy. A game in which the impossible seems both effortless and graceful. Keeping up a rattan ball with your foot. The truth of course is that it requires a lot of practice and skill and a specific mindset. Team members need to cooperate. They need to be perfectly attuned to each other. It's a mentality that the world badly needs right now. A mentality that the EU and ASEAN countries can benefit from. Together. To respond to the challenges we are facing. The COVID-19 pandemic. Climate change. Security threats around us. To keep all balls in the air, we need to work together as a team. The Treaty of Amity and Cooperation in Southeast Asia is an important step in that direction. And with that in mind, I'd like to thank the embassies of the five ASEAN countries represented here in The Hague for organizing this webinar. Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand and Vietnam. An important gesture that's perfectly in line with the goals and spirit of the treaty. But let me also use this occasion to thank all the ASEAN countries for agreeing to the accessions of my country. I look forward to working with all of you. For the Netherlands, the importance of partnering with ASEAN is growing all the time. The EU and ASEAN are both economic powerhouses. And in these times of rapid geoeconomic and geopolitical change, ASEAN plays a key role in the Indo-Pacific region. What's more, we share a similar outlook on the world. We want peace and prosperity for our citizens. And we know that the only way forward is a world with rules. Rules that we stick to. The Netherlands has long-standing ties with Southeast Asia. 
In many ASEAN countries, we are among the largest foreign investors and trading partners. Between October and December last year, we ran a successful virtual trade mission to five ASEAN states. The Netherlands also welcomes the recent signing of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. We hope and expect that the treaty will have a positive effect on trade with the EU. As I mentioned, we are a strong supporter of international rules that every country must adhere to. They are essential for peace, for economic prosperity and our de democratic values. The EU ASEAN Strategic Partnership that we agreed on last year is an excellent basis for working together to protect and reinforce these rules. In this slide, let me commend Indonesia and Malaysia for their efforts to set up a special ASEAN meeting on the situation in Myanmar. I share your concerns about the military coup on the 1st of February. We are urging the military leaders to immediately release those who have been detained and to respect the constitution and the outcome of the elections. As I mentioned, our countries need to work together to respond to the challenges we are facing. The COVID-19 pandemic has hit countries in Southeast Asia and Europe hard. The Netherlands ASEAN webinar on the pandemic, hosted by the Indonesian Embassy last July, underlines our readiness to cooperate and exchange experiences on tackling the virus. The Netherlands and ASEAN also have a lot to offer each other when it comes to climate adaptation measures, especially in the areas of water and agriculture. We welcomed the active way that many of the ASEAN states took part in the Climate Adaptation Summit. And there are plenty of other areas for cooperation, such as connectivity, security, counterterrorism, and shared values. Ladies and gentlemen, ASEAN and the EU's recipes for success are quite similar. By working with the countries around us, we have become more prosperous. And by working together, we have succeeded in living in relative peace for decades. Let's combine these powerful forces. Let's work together. Let's play a game of Sepak Tako. I wish you all a successful webinar. Thank you. Uh, we now have the honor of inviting His Excellency Gatot Lim Jokoi, the Secretary General of ASEAN, for his keynote speech. Excellency, Mr. Secretary General, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, uh, let me uh, take this opportunity to thank His Excellency Maya Fass, the Ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia to the Kingdom of Netherlands and Chair of the ASEAN Committee in The Hague uh, for hosting this webinar. His Excellency Minister of Foreign Affairs Netherlands, State Block, Ambassador of ASEAN Member State, the Kingdom of Netherlands, Senior Official of Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Kingdom of Netherlands, Distinguished Speaker, discussing ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, allow me to congratulate the ASEAN Committee in The Hague for spearheading this webinar, which is timely and for the first, for two reasons. First, the webinar, which brings together policymakers and academics to discuss the achievement and role of the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation in Southeast Asia in a regional and global affair is an excellent occasion to mark the 45th anniversary of the treaty, which was signed in 1976. Second, we look forward to the welcoming the Netherlands uh, as a high contracting party with its, with its accession to the TAC later this year. The Netherlands accession to the TSC would make it as fifth, will make it the sixth 
European country and entity to do so after Russia, France, United Kingdom, Norway, and Germany. In addition to the European Union, in recent years, ASEAN has seen an increasing interest by external partner, the Netherlands included, to forge closer ties with our regional organization. The TSC as a legally binding instrument that codified set of norms governing the relation among the high contracting parties of Southeast Asia. Principles such as the peaceful settlement of dispute, the re renunciation of the threat or use of force in the interstate relations, and mutual respect for the, in for the independence sovereignty, quality, territorial integrity, and national identity of all nations are not just central tenets of the TSC, but are also the foundation of the ASEAN community form which a stable, prosperous, prosperous, inclusive, and sustainable region is built upon. To date, a total of 33 partners of ASEAN have acceded to the treaty of bringing to 43 of the total high contracting parties. In hindsight, the TSC is one of the most underappreciated success stories of ASEAN. The noble idea to forge peaceful relations among the then five contracting parties in 1976 had become a strong positive force for regional peace and stability. The socialization of the principles enshrined in the TSE among the 33 non-ASEAN contracting parties, including the five permanent members of United Nations Security Council, India, Japan, Brazil, South Africa, and United Arab, United Arab Emirates, is evidence of the broad global appeal to the treaty. More importantly, the widespread support of the TSC is a tacit acceptance of the ASEAN centrality in the regional affairs. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the Netherlands accession to the TSC will no doubt add a strong voice to bolstering support of multilateralism and pave the way for substantive bilateral cooperation on affirming the primacy of international law in global affairs. In this regard, I would like to single out the training program, the law of the seas for diplomats and officials from ASEAN member states and ASEAN secretariat for the commendation uh, as a model of our blossoming bilateral cooperation. The training program, which is now in its fifth iteration, was just concluded two weeks ago, is a useful capacity building initiative in addition to further improving the rapport among ASEAN and Dutch legal specialists. It is also important to note that while the Netherlands might be a relatively newcomer as part of the TSC's concern, it has long standing ties and multifaceted relation with ASEAN and the ASEAN member states. For example, bilateral trade is in the upward trend. Total two way trade between ASEAN and the, and the Netherlands has increased from 35.5 billion in 2010 to US 40.5 billion in 2018. As far as people to people interaction is concerned, a number of tourist arrival from the Netherlands to ASEAN has risen each year since 2013, reaching the figure to more than 787,000 tourists in 2019. No doubt the upward trend has been impacted by COVID-19 pandemic. In response to the pandemic negative impact, ASEAN has proactively adopted and is in the midst of implementing 
the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework to not only undertake a concerted and collective efforts to mitigate the pandemic, but also pave the way towards building an ASEAN community that is more united, stronger, and dynamic. Along with the initiatives such as COVID-19 Response Fund, the ASEAN Center Public Health Emergency and Emergence Diseases, the ASEAN Regional Reserve of Medical Supplies, and the ongoing discussion on the ASEAN Trouble Corridor Arrangement Framework. Our aim is not just to build back better, but in more importantly, our objective is to make ASEAN community more resilient and sustainable in the future for the, to the future shocks. Notwithstanding its negative impact, I do believe the pandemic has also opened up a new area of cooperation between ASEAN and the Netherlands, as well as European Union, specifically in the area of prevention and mitigation epidemics, as well as collaborated efforts towards a recovery from the pandemic. Consultation and mutual support in multilateral fora and initiatives such as the World Health Organization, the World Trade Organization, and COVID will further elevate our bilateral ties and increase our collective voices to strengthen multilateralism and lend support to the good and important work of international organizations such as the WHO and WTO. Beyond the context of COVID-19 pandemic recovery efforts and the new normal, we look forward to working closely with the, with the Netherlands to address the issue of climate change, UN Sustainable Development Goals, Paris Sea, armed robbery at sea, as well as peacekeeping and peace building. The Netherlands expertise in renewal technologies such as wind power and tidal energy and experience in managing the rise of sea level could also make an immense contribution to the creation of a greener, safer, safer and a more sustainable ASEAN community. On the positive note, on the positive expressional note, I warmly welcome the Netherlands continue strong and mutual beneficial engagement with ASEAN and look forward to welcoming the Netherlands as our newest, newest high contracting parties of the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation in Southeast Asia later this year. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Excellency Secretary General. We have come to the conclusion of the opening session. It gives me now distinct pleasure to hand over to the moderator of the following session, Dr. Mohamed Marisham bin Mohamed Isha. Dr. Marisham, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Yuda, our chairperson today. Um, His Excellency, uh, uh, Mr. Steph Lott, Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, the Kingdom of Netherlands. His Excellency, uh, Dr. Lim Chok Hoi, the Secretary General of ASEAN. <coughs> Excellencies, participants, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the ASEAN Committee of Akai The Hague, I would like to welcome Excellencies and everyone uh, today in this webinar um, to enable us to discuss and elaborate an important and an important issue to us. The Netherlands accession to the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation of ASEAN, nothing. The, marking the country as the third among the EU members to become a high contracting party to this important international agreement. Indeed, the accession of Kingdom of the Netherlands 
to the TAC would be another milestone in the relations between ASEAN and the Netherlands. Today we have four distinguished persons uh, comprising two distinguished speakers and two discussions uh, respectively, who will share their wisdom on what it means to both parties, ASEAN and Netherlands, arising and entailing, and arising from and entailing uh, from the uh, important and historic event. I uh, would like to introduce our two speakers today. Uh, we have uh, Her Excellency uh, Ambassador Karin Mosalekna, um, the, director, the director of Asia and Oceania Department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. Uh, Ambassador Karin is a senior diplomat of the Netherlands with a very um, wide experience. She has um, served in various capacities in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands, as well as have been posted, has been posted to New Delhi, Bern, and recently as Ambassador of Netherlands, the Netherlands in Malaysia. Um, I also have uh, the second speaker today is um, Excellency, Her Excellency Exiri Pintaruchi, Ambassador of Thailand, uh, Ambassador of Kingdom of Thailand to, um, to the Netherlands. Um, Ambassador Pintaruchi is also a very senior and experienced diplomat uh, who has uh, served in various capacities in, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Thailand, uh, including as the um, Director General of the Department of International Economic Affairs, as well as have been, has been posted to Seoul, Korea, to Geneva, Switzerland, and currently as Ambassador of Thailand to the Kingdom of Netherlands. That is our two distinguished speakers. Uh, with us today, we have two important personalities as well. Um, I have, uh, we have uh, Professor Ronald Horshata, a professor of comparative multi-level governance and regional structure at the University of Groningen, Faculty of Spatial Sciences and the Faculty of Arts, Department of International Relations and International Organization. Professor Horshata has, is currently a director of the Groningen Research Center of Southeast Asia and ASEAN, or Sea ASEAN, an interdisciplinary and interfaculty research program offering training to over 22 candidates, PhD candidates from across Southeast Asia today. He is most recently co-editor of the books titled uh, Challenges of Governance, Development and Regional Integration in Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia and ASEAN in 2021 and Sustainable Development Goals in Southeast Asia and ASEAN national and regional approaches in 2019. Another distinguished discussion is uh, Dr. Shafia Muhibat. Um, she is the head of the Department of International Relations, Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS Indonesia. She joined CSIS, CSIS in December 2000, and since then has taken part in extensive research projects on economics, on politics, sorry, on politics and regional security in Southeast Asia and the Asia Pacific. In 2017, she joined the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies at SRS Singapore as a senior fellow at the Maritime Security Program for one year. She has special interest in issues of regional security in East Asia, in East Asia ASEAN, maritime security, Indonesia's foreign, foreign policy and development cooperation. Previously, she was the chief editor of the International Quart Ind Indonesian Quarterly, a quarterly economic journal published by CSIS from 2013 to 2016. She was also a lecturer at two private universities in Jakarta from 2005 to 2009. She obtained a Master of Science from the London School of Economics 
and political science in 2003, and a doctorate from the University of Hamburg in 2013. Uh, before we proceed further, allow me to share with you uh, the procedure for the session. We will, of course, try to reduce some formalities and make this session as casual as possible uh, to give you insights um, the uh, matters leading to and entailing from this important event, that is the accession of the, Net uh, the Netherlands to TEC. Um, first, um, first part will include Ambassador, Ambassador uh, Mosa Lechna, who will share her wisdom and followed by Ambassador Axiri Pintaruji. Secondly, our two discussants will also elaborate further the messages by um, Minister Block, by uh, Dr. Lim Jok Hoi, as, as well as Ambassador Maya Fass. Uh, the, the two discussants will also elaborate um, matters um, uh, that came up from the, the speeches of, uh, by Ambassador Karim Mosalefna and Ambassador Pintarici. Um, just a little bit of uh, program modification. Uh, we are going to have question and answer session after uh, the discussions uh, have completed their, their elaboration. However, because uh, Ambassador Pintaruchi will have to leave uh, slightly early today as she has um, another important, similarly important event, then we have to um, invite the questions for her uh, and deal with it, uh, uh, deal with those questions first. And then without further ado, allow me to invite Her Excellency Ambassador Karin Mosalakna to deliver her speech. You have the floor, Ambassador. Thank you so much, uh, Mahisham, and uh, good morning, everyone, uh, Excellencies, uh, everyone in the audience. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with you. Can you hear me, by the way? Lovely. Yes. Okay. Clear. Thank you so Very much. Clear. Yes. Now, the, and I just put on the gallery view. Otherwise, I'm just facing my own face, and it's already, of course, a pity that we have to have this meeting online instead of in person. At least I can see some faces now. Unfortunately, not everyone. But it's good to be here with you uh, today. Uh, and uh, as, you, as you mentioned, uh, I also have a personal attachment, of course, to the ASEAN region. I, I recently returned from, from uh, posting there uh, as an ambassador to Malaysia. So I'm very pleased that you are hosting this session today. And this is actually also a very important step in further strengthening the relations between my country and the countries of the ASEAN and the ASEAN itself. Um, and uh, yeah, first, let me uh, also express my sincere appreciation to the ASEAN committee in The Hague for organizing this, this very timely webinar on uh, the accession of the Netherlands to the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation in Southeast Asia. Um, I will focus in my uh, short intervention on the uh, considerations of the Netherlands, from our side, uh, why do we want to become a, a, a party to the a high contracting party to the Treaty of Amity and Co Cooperation? Uh, but maybe I can I should start first with a few words on the process and where we stand. Uh, and it's good to give you some of the background as well. Uh, on, uh, 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 as, as you know, on, on, on June uh, in June 2020, uh, our minister uh, Steph Block uh, sent a letter to uh, the foreign minister of Vietnam, uh, uh, officially formally applying to accede to the to the treaty. Uh, and uh, during the 37th ASEAN online summit, uh, um, this uh, was uh, approved consensually. So we're very pleased that we can now take the steps that are needed to uh, to to formally accede. Our uh, ministerial council agreed on the 22nd of January 
uh, uh, to proceed with the uh, with the, the accession, and uh, we now have sent the proposal, which is a standard procedure, to uh, our uh, Council of States. It's the highest advisory board in the Netherlands, the Raad van State, for those of you who have been here longer, uh, and it has to uh, present its advice, and we hope that uh, that will come soon and then it, the, the proposal can be sent in principle for silent approval to the parliament. Uh, we don't expect this is going to be a controversial issue because as you know we have a demissionary government now and they're not dealing with issues that are controversial but our uh, estimate and our hope is that this is not going to be a con controversial issue and it can be dealt with swiftly uh, and then as soon as uh, the uh, parliament has uh, agreed uh, we uh, will be in touch uh, probably with then uh, still hopefully with the, the with the government of brunei the current asean chair to, to discuss the exact, exact moment of okay. position. So just to let you know where, where we stand. In, uh, in, but now maybe the more important question, uh, the why question, um, our minister of course already mentioned uh, uh, many reasons why uh, we would like to, uh, to, to accede to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the Treaty of Amity Cooperation. Uh, but most of it, it, most of all, it is uh, for us to 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 to, to show uh, how much we uh, value uh, the the role of ASEAN uh, in the wider region, also in the wider geopolitical context, uh, and also that we see many similarities in many areas where we have shared interests, where we want to work together. Um, the geopolitical developments uh, and, and global challenges that we are facing urgently call for closer cooperation, not just bilaterally, but also between the EU uh, and ASEAN. Uh, we see that many of the trends that were already ongoing actually were accelerated by the, by the COVID-19 crisis. It seems to be uh, not just a, a challenge in the field of, uh, of global health, but also a pressure cooker for international relations and, and geopolitics. Uh, it's posing us for economic challenges as well. We have to face questions about how are we going to rebuild our economy and are we going to do that in a sustainable manner? It poses us for security challenges. Uh, so it is an important uh, area and an, an important uh, catalyst for many developments. It's all the more important that we work together uh, both uh, as EU uh, with ASEAN and uh, bilaterally as the Netherlands um, and hence our uh, also request to uh, to accede to the treaty. Um, as you may know, the EU is also at the initiative of the Netherlands, and Germany and France, uh, and inspired by the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, working on an increasing its engagement with the Indo-Pacific region. And uh, in, in that context, uh, ASEAN, among others, um, Australia as well. I understand the Australian investor is in the, in the midst of us as well somewhere. Uh, but uh, also they, they are key partners for us in this endeavor. So we want to work closer together with you. Uh, we recently published our own uh, Indo-Pacific paper uh, as the Netherlands, indicating our intention for increased cooperation and engagement with countries in the region and particularly those who have shared interests, and this specifically includes uh, ASEAN countries. Uh, and in our view, uh, the EU should be seeking a, a more active role and more active engagement uh, in the region. Uh, in this regard, we also want to welcome the, uh, the EU-ASEAN uh, strategic partnership that uh, has been uh, announced on the 1st of December last year. So it allows us also to have discussions uh, at, at the highest uh, agenda, uh, at the highest level, and uh, also to, to pursue the issues on, on our joint agenda at the highest level. Uh, among those issues, uh, well, um, I will, I will get back to that. I think the main focus of our relationship uh, remains uh, uh, the economic cooperation uh, with some of you also, uh, development cooperation, uh, sustainable development, uh, but it is clear that we also should engage more in, in the political and security area. 
Uh, and for example, I think the Secretary General um, of, of ASEAN, uh, Dato Lim Jok Hoi, just mentioned it as well. Uh, uh, when it comes to uh, the Netherlands, uh, we uh, have a lot of knowledge about uh, the international law of the sea and we organized uh, courses uh, uh, with uh, ASEAN countries about it as well. And I think that might also help to co contribute to uh, the political and, and, uh, and, and security uh, in the region. Um, so uh, we are fully aware as Netherlands, but I think it's broader in the felt in the EU that we should, should go beyond from being a, a simple trade actor and becoming a, a more active partner overall in the region, in all the areas uh, uh, that also ASEAN is, is working on. Um, we, we share many interests uh, between uh, the EU and ASEAN. Uh, and I think we should join hands, uh, for instance, in protecting the rules-based international order human rights, effective multilateralism, which is in all our interest, uh, adherence to rule of law, uh, including, as I mentioned, the law of the sea. Uh, and uh, we need to, to strengthen uh, our, our cooperation also to be able to make sure that uh, we can uphold our interests and uphold our values, which is much needed in, in, in current world where uh, these, these, these values and also, uh, the, the multilateralism uh, and uh, uh, international rules of law are uh, under under increasing uh, uh, challenges, facing increasing challenges. Um, even uh, the, even though there is a difference in, in systems of governments uh, among the ASEAN members, most of the ASEAN members are very much supportive of uh, regional cooperation, multilateralism, rules based international order, and so are we. So there's a lot of ground to work together. Uh, and we should work together in, in the areas that I mentioned. We should also, I think, work together and actively work together uh, to uh, tackle the already very visible negative impacts of climate change. A green recovery from COVID-19 crisis, something that's mentioned a lot, but we have to make it work. We have to make it concrete. And that is something that should be high on the bilateral agenda. Uh, sustainable development will also be an important part of our joint agenda in the period to come. Uh, I think we have a lot we can offer in the field of, uh, for instance, climate adaptation measures. We're very glad, by the way, by the level of participation, the amount of participation also from the ASEAN uh, states uh, in the recent climate adaptation summit that was hosted uh, by our prime minister online uh, on the 25th of January. Uh, so we have to work together in this area. We also have a lot of issues that are related to uh, climate adaptations, for instance, in the field of water technology, agriculture, where the Netherlands is already working closely together with many ASEAN countries, but we hope to increase our cooperation there. Furthermore, an issue uh, of cooperation is the connectivity and uh, the Netherlands uh, likes to call itself the, the gateway to Europe. We are a global connectivity hub and we very much welcome the EU and ASEAN also joining hands together in the area of connectivity and exploring uh, a possible partnership on connectivity. The EU uh, already signed a connectivity partnership with Japan, and we're now working with ASEAN on a connectivity partnership uh, that could help us in many areas of standard setting, uh, level playing fields, uh, sustainability, quality infrastructure, and that is important for, for all our countries. So we would like to work together with you in further exploring the connectivity agenda. Um, uh, this very much relates also to the, to the uh, important issues that we both have uh, when it comes to open trade, close connections between our countries. Uh, and uh, um, the Netherlands has been thriving uh, in a, a climate where trade has been uh, open, where we have a live, level playing field. Uh, and uh, many of the ASEAN countries also very much are trading countries with a long trading history. And um, it is important that we work together uh, to, to, to work on the, uh, our economic welfare uh, of the nation states, of the ASEAN, of our nation states in the EU, and on the well-being of our people. Uh, so those are areas where we can work together. And in the end, if we have close 
cooperation in the field of trade and investments that will also enhance stability and re reduce the risk of conflict. Um, I mentioned the COVID crisis already, and it is has hit our country's heart, uh, both in Southeast Asia and in Europe. Uh, our economies are affected by it, and we have to overcome this crisis and start uh, thinking about rebuilding it. But first of all, we also have to think about how we manage the health situation, how we make sure that all, uh, our, all the peoples in the world uh, get access to the uh, vaccines uh, as soon as possible. Uh, uh, in Europe, we experience it already as a, an, an enormous challenge to uh, get uh, 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 the access to the, to the vaccines uh, at the moment we were hoping to get them, some of them were not available. Um, so it is uh, going to be an, a challenge for all of us and we have to join hands, we have to work together here uh, because this global pandemic can only be overcome if we overcome it together and if everyone in the world gets, in, in the end, uh, gets uh, uh, the vaccination that is needed uh, against the virus. Uh, and finally, uh, I mentioned already uh, the cooperation in the field of stability and security, and uh, we see a world that is increasingly polarized. ASEAN and the EU uh, both have the intention in this world not to become a play, uh, not to become a playground, uh, but to be a player where we can serve our own interests. And if we want to become a player and not a playground, we have to work together and we have to join forces. Uh, and we have to work together also in the area of uh, security, uh, maritime security, the, uh, the, the open sea routes are very important for us, also for us as a trading country. Uh, the area of cybersecurity, there is already quite a lot of cooperation with, with many of you, but that's an area that is going to be increasingly important in the years to come. And we hope to increase our cooperation as well. Uh, Counterterrorism is on our, uh, our agenda for cooperation as well. And I hope we can also strengthen our cooperation on the peaceful settlement of disputes. Um, I'm a minister already uh, mentioned uh, the, our concerns about the situation in, in, uh, in Myanmar, and that also has uh, I think security repercussions for, for the region. We welcome uh, the initiative by Indonesia and uh, Malaysia to, to have uh, and, uh, and, uh, so to open a, 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 a debate on, 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 on this situation, and we are ready to work with you in this regard as well. Um, so uh, many issues that I mentioned for cooperation, our minister also dwelt on many of them already, and we very much look forward to, to cooperating in, in all the three pillars, in the political security area, the economic uh, area, and of course also, and that's an area that I did not mention so far, but in the socio-economic, uh, socio-cultural area, because the people-to-people -people contact in the end are also ex extremely important, we cannot not overestimate that. Uh, when it comes to education exchanges, student exchanges, mm -hmm. cultural exchanges, we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Erasmus House, which is our cultural center in Jakarta. Uh, and uh, we very much hope that we can further increase the cultural exchanges between uh, the Netherlands and the countries from the ASEAN region. Hopefully, in real life, sometime again, for the time being, we've become very good in doing these exchanges online. But it is important that we also get to connect the people again uh, in the real in, 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 in the near future. And as soon as the situation allows, I hope that we can have these type of exchanges as well. So, with these words, I would just would like to, to 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 give the floor back to to our, our moderator. But uh, thank you once again for organizing this this dialogue, and I very much look forward to the the the, the remainder of the of the discussion, and of course also to exploring with you all these issues that are on our mutual agenda. Thank you. Um, thank you very much indeed, um, Your Excellency. Um, it was a very short and sweet, and I believe that our um, participants today have, um, uh, have learned a lot uh, from your uh, point of view. Uh, uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Her Excellency Okay. Uh, 
of uh, Her, Her Excellency Aksiri Pintarichi to share her wisdom. Her Excellency, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone, and uh, Excellencies. Uh, thank you for, uh, um, for the invitations, and I'm very pleased to join in this session. Um, first, I'd like to thank Ambassador Mayafes, my dear friends, uh, and all colleagues at the uh, Indonesian embassies for initiating uh, this webinar. And I'd like to express my uh, deep appreciation for the address given by His Excellency uh, Minister Vlog uh, and the ASEAN Secretary General earlier. Uh, their participation reflects how important uh, the Dutch and ASEAN attach to mm -hmm. our, uh, the prospects of our uh, re uh, greater and further cooperation. I would also like to thank um, my dear friend, Ambassador Karen, for uh, your uh, intervention earlier, which has helped uh, lessen my uh, task today. Uh, you have uh, been able to uh, uh, explain in uh, much details on, on a lot of uh, points which are uh, very important. And I'd like to also thank you for your vital role in contributing to the relations between ASEAN and the Netherlands uh, in various areas during this past year. Um, on, on my part, um, today I, I've been asked to uh, share my views on uh, as an, Thailand as an ASEAN country uh, on, on the, uh, the Netherlands' accessions to the attack and the potential collaboration between the two sides. Many uh, points of view have already been uh, well uh, elaborated by the previous uh, speakers and, and by ministers and by the Secretary General. So I will be uh, uh, Brief and so let the uh, session be uh, further uh, so that I will be able to uh, uh, have time for the question and answer session. First, I would I like to stress that Thailand is also one of the countries who uh, support, very much support and welcome the NATO session to the, 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 the T of Amity and Cooperation. And the, the ASEAN uh, have consensus acceptance of the Netherlands uh, to accede to two tasks uh, due to, to various reasons, but uh, the, there are main reasons and factors that the, uh, that ensure the Netherlands accession, which are that the Netherlands has long history of engagement with our ASEAN countries, both bilaterally and through the ASEAN framework. And the Netherlands have proven track record of delivery of peace, yeah. justice, and okay. security, both at the global level. And another point is that uh, the Netherlands and ASEAN have shared values and principles of, on bilateral and rule-based uh, cooperation. So these, I believe, are important factors. Uh, what are among the important factors that ASEAN uh, have uh, uh, consensus in supporting the Netherlands uh, to accede to the task. And it's also reaffirmed uh, some of the points that I'd like to make. The, the Netherlands extension to task, to task also reaffirm that uh, the, the Netherlands and ASEAN have shared principles and values based on our dogs relations on rule based, uh, which uh, we give important to multilateral free trade and sustainable development. And we strive to build uh, the communities which will have people at the center or the people center community. We uh, both uh, the Netherlands and ASEAN to uh, the EU as well. We want to have the community where we, the people can enjoy life for uh, respect of human rights. So these are the important uh, shared principles and values both the Netherlands and ASEAN have. And another important point is that, uh, uh, as we, as also mentioned earlier by by uh, Foreign Minister Block, is that amidst the uh, 
rapid challenge of the, the world today, in particular the, the COVID outbreak, it is more imperative than ever that we don't let the physical distancing uh, uh, become obstruct uh, of our diplomatic distancing. It means that we need each other more than ever to help uh, each other out the crisis and help each other in to face the uh, common challenge. Uh, I, whether it be the pandemic, the, the, uh, the challenge of, of climate change and uh, the natural disasters, terrorism, uh, geopolitical tensions, all this reaffirm the need for greater international cooperation. In particular, this kind of coalitions of like-minded countries that we will be able to achieve mutual respect, mutual trust, and mutual benefits. It's, it's also important. So this affirmed that uh, more than ever that the Netherlands and ASEAN need each other. And we also welcome to see the Netherlands Indo-Pacific guidelines that uh, published earlier, which uh, we note that uh, share many principles with the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific. In particular, both paper place the importance of international law at the cornerstones of uh, peace and justice, and it will help with uh, tensions and confrontations. So we believe that uh, this can uh, form the basis and cornerstones for further collaborations uh, between uh, not just on the the Netherlands and ASEAN, but also EU and ASEAN as well. And we also well, very much welcome uh, the step up uh, between ASEAN and EU, uh, the strategic partnership, which also will form, uh, uh, be an important foundation for greater collaboration in many fields. So um, in terms of uh, collaborations between the Netherlands and ASEAN, after the Netherlands accession to Thai. As I told her with uh, the foreign ministers, uh, Excellencies uh, Ling Chokhoi and, and Karen earlier that it's important that we also need to focus more on uh, action after uh, we exceed to, uh, uh, to the practical, uh, to the, the formalities. Uh, and many of you have uh, rightly uh, list out the potential areas of cooperation. And there are various channels of uh, cooperation as well, either through uh, the ASEAN, the Netherlands, and the Net and already through the existing channel between the Netherlands and bilateral uh, platform with uh, ASEAN countries, and also ASEAN EU uh, collaboration platform as well. So th there are many possible possibilities of collaboration can be done. And I, we know that uh, the, the areas of collaboration can cover both, as mentioned earlier by Karen, through focus on economic and sustainable development, but also on the area of political and security, which will cover uh, the three pillars of ASEAN, as uh, mentioned earlier, that is uh, namely political security community, economic community, and socio-cultural community as well. So for, for ASEAN and the Netherlands, one area that I would like to also highlight is the area of development uh, that both uh, chair uh, importance place high priority as an important area. The Netherlands is a global renown for its championing in uh, the area of climate change and innovative technology. So um, to achieve uh, the SDG, global partnership for development is a key. So the ASEAN and the Netherlands could continue working on technical cooperation and, and work together in, in various areas. And Minister Bloss and Kevin have named 
the area of climate adaptation, that agriculture and water uh, management, including other areas like uh, connectivity, economic trade, and connectivity. I would also like to stress the uh, importance of uh, not just only hardware, software, but sustainable connectivity, green connectivity, and um, digital connectivity, and people to people uh, connectivity, which uh, you have mentioned that the Netherlands have uh, a very high expertise in the area of education and, and, and academic uh, area as well. In terms of securities, we face uh, a lot of challenge, not just on the uh, securities in the uh, formal way, but also cyber securities and, and uh, the, the uh, human trafficking, those areas is also have been uh, the areas of uh, bilateral collaboration before that could also be expanded in uh, the, the at the regional uh, area, uh, uh, the regional level as well. So, so these uh, are the area that uh, are potential area of col collaboration in the Netherlands and, and and ASEAN. And in terms of uh, sustainable development, uh, ASEAN has one center uh, for uh, a center for sustainable development studies and dialogue, which uh, established in, in, in Thailand uh, back in, I think, in 2019. And this center uh, work as a platform to promote uh, sustainable development dialogue and studies. And we have been working uh, as a coordinator in this area and working not just on the among ASEAN countries but external partners. EU is one of the important uh, contributors and partner and active uh, uh, players in in, in this uh, center as well. So we look forward to welcoming the Netherlands uh, to work with us. Uh, we, uh, in this uh, ASEAN Center for Sustainable Development Studies and that. So um, I think um, at this moment, I have uh, covered uh, the, the few points that I make at this moment. So I give the floor back to the moderators and look forward to further discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Uh, it seems that the two, um, our two distinguished speakers have spoken extensively on, 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 on the TAC as well as the um, Netherlands uh, uh, accession uh, to the uh, uh, that have basically complemented all three pillars of ASEAN. Uh, I have a request by the, uh, the host today that uh, not the request. I've been instructed by by the host today that uh, that, in, that that we have received a uh, uh, request from Ambassador Karin as well because she has uh, another similarly important uh, 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 task to do later on. Then she has to to leave uh, our session slightly earlier than 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 uh, than expected. So we are going to deal with the questions. Uh, for uh, Ambassador Karin and uh, Ambassador Axe. First, before we can proceed uh, with the um, uh, with the discussion by the Professor Ron and uh, Dr. Fiti. So I'm sorry, Professor, that you and Dr. Fiti, you have to to bear with us um, slightly. Um, uh, we you have to bear with us because your session will be. Um, slightly postponed. So let me um, let me. Um, I am having a mountain task because today I have to doubt. I have to deal with a with an overwhelming number of questions. Basically, um, allow me to pose two questions to Ambassador uh, Karin. Uh, two questions first, and then to be followed by by two questions for Ambassador. Uh, actually, um, first question, Amanda, Karin, 
that um, from the Dutch perspective, will there be any challenges in observing the values and principles instilled in the TAC? For example, the principle of non-interference in domestic affairs, BRB, the interest of uh, the interest to advance a rule-based international order. Um, and uh, and uh, second question is the the non-traditional threats of security continue to arise. Cybersecurity threat is one of the new age challenges pertinent to both the Netherlands and the ASEAN countries. Understanding the gap in capacity and technology, not only between the Netherlands and most of ASEAN countries, but also amongst the ASEAN member, the ASEAN countries themselves. What are the specific that the Netherlands can offer in this regard? including in terms of transfer of technology and capacity building. You have the floor, Ambassador. Thank you. And I think I already uh, unmuted my microphone. So, um, so I can uh, immediately start to speak. But thank you so much. And thank you for, for these questions. Um, thank, thanks to the audience for these questions, I have to say. Um, um, when it comes to uh, the, uh, the the challenges uh, we're going to face, I think there's always a discussion when it comes to uh, um, issues. Uh, for for instance, when you have issues of serious concern with uh, human rights angles, uh, security related issues, whether um, these issues are serious enough to discuss them uh, uh, in uh, internationally or not, and. Uh, it's uh, always an interesting discussion. I've had several discussions with uh, with uh, representatives from the ASEAN when I was posted in Malaysia uh, um, uh, about uh, developments at that time uh, already in, uh, in, in in Myanmar that were of concern and where does the principle of non-interference stop and where uh, those issues become so serious that they are actually not just relevant within a country, but have repercussions for 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 the broader region as well. Uh, and I think it is important to have this discussion. And I think the discussion is taking place in ASEAN as well. So and um, I mentioned the initiative by Indonesia and in Malaysia to discuss this specific issue. Um, and I think as for the Netherlands, when it comes, I think we we very much believe in. Um, uh, uh, in the in, in the sovereignty of, of countries and in in the in the in the in the in the in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the independence of countries, uh, but at the same time, if there are serious concerns, gross human rights violations, I think it's also in uh, in, uh, in a part of our policy that we speak out. Whatever situation it is, no matter what country it is, we don't discriminate there. But we think that issues that are of grave concern when it comes to international law need to be uh, violations of international law of human rights need to be raised. So and I think it is important to have that discussion with each other as well and to, to see what are the areas where we have to stand up for certain for certain values for certain area issues and uh, it's, a, it's a continued discussion we're having with the, with the countries from the ASEAN region as well. And I hope we can have this discussion and continue to have this discussion also in, in, the, in, the, in the upcoming period, because in the end, some of the values that we are having are under threat. And, uh, and, uh, and I think it is important that we work together also to uphold these values and, uh, and that we stand up for human rights and that we stand up for democracy. Uh, and uh, that we find the best way to deal with these issues so in, in, in our engagement, in our dialogue as well. Uh, and rules-based international order is not something that we can take for granted. And uh, uh, we've uh, lived in a world where uh, uh, power politics uh, uh, for, for, for centuries has been a very important, of course, uh, the most important instrument. And the rules-based international order that we've built actually since the past seven decades uh, has brought us a lot of stability and a lot of security and prosperity and, and welfare and well-being for our people. Uh, and it's something worth uh, uh, also uh, protecting and we need to do that together with, with the countries uh, that share similar views and, and similar interests, including the countries from the ASEAN region. Um, there's a lot to say about this issue, and we could have a, a separate seminar on that, but maybe I, I should make a study to cybersecurity uh, 
threat and um, uh, what can we do? Well, it, it was five years ago the Netherlands hosted the, uh, the Global Cyberspace Conference and also we set up some capacity building uh, instruments there, a global capacity building in the area of, of cybersecurity. So these instruments are still available and we very much like to work together with other countries also, uh, and, and also uh, uh, helping to, to set the standards but also to, to, to build and to work on the resilience uh, from other countries in the world on in the, in the area of cyber threats. We're working closely together already with uh, uh, Singapore for instance but also with Indonesia. We recently had a, a, a cyber security dialogue with Indonesia and we hope to extend the dialogue also to other countries from the ASEAN region, because this is the area, uh, I think, for the coming period of concern. And uh, it is affect if, if we don't take the right measures, if we don't take the right so it can affect our, our uh, economies, it can affect uh, our privacy, it can affect our societies. So we have to build our resilience and we have to do it together. And this is an area where we hope to increase our dialogue with the, with the countries from the ASEAN as well. Thank you so much Ambassador, for your comprehensive answer. Um, yeah, so wait for a while because I, I need to shift the question to Ambassador, uh, Ambassador Pintanti. Um, Ambassador, I have two questions here. Uh, number one, um, from the ASEAN country side, what would be the challenges faced by, the, by ASEAN to be in the driver's seat? especially with the looming great power rivalries and interests. How relevant the treaty, in this, the treaty is in this regard? And why did ASEAN agree to the Netherlands to request the accession? What do ASEAN expect from the Netherlands accession to the treaty? And what can ASEAN offer to the Netherlands? My second question is a number of countries in the greater Indo-Pacific formulated their own conception of Indo-Pacific strategy or guideline. What would and can ASEAN do to ensure that ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific can serve as a platform of cooperation amongst all the competing interests in the greater, greater Indo-Pacific? You have the floor, Mr. Thank you. Uh, for the, 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 the questions. Um, First, uh, regarding the challenges faced by ASEAN, um, I believe as the uh, regional grouping, um, um, we are, have all faced uh, quite similar challenges. For, for ASEAN, um, the first, um, there's a number of challenges faced uh, by ASEAN. The first um, uh, challenges that I uh, think that uh, we are facing and we are striving to overcome it is to continue to uh, to achieve our uh, final uh, goal of community building in all three pillars that is political security economic and so social culture uh, ASEAN need to continue on the course uh, to enhance and achieve uh, our integration of community building, which is our final goal, um, which we believe that uh, uh, through uh, this uh, this final goal of community building, we'll be able to strengthen our regional listen and and to help us uh, be able to cope with uh, various challenges. So this is the first challenge uh, challenge uh, that that us will continue to need to. Cope. To address the second challenge is um, that uh, as ASEAN is an outward-looking um, organization or body, uh, we have uh, been uh, building up uh, a convening power over the years. Uh, ASEAN currently has uh, ten dialogue partners, four sectoral dialogue partners, three development partners and relations uh, chips with some nine regional and international organizations. Uh, we have um, various ASEAN-led mechanisms such as ARF, uh, EAS or East Asian Summit, ASEAN plus three, ASEAN Defense uh, Minister Mechanism. With these 
regional architectures that uh, platforms that we have built up, we need to ensure that the, these platforms for the discussion work and help uh, enhance confidence building and constructive and concrete cooperation uh, all along. And we continue to work together with uh, such directions. And this will uh, help enhance strategic trust it, not just only among ASEAN uh, members, but also with the major powers and, and, and we will be able to achieve uh, what we call as win-win cooperation. And third, uh, our third challenge, uh, our third uh, point is that ASEAN has also uh, had a set of conduct that we have developed over the years. Um, and the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation is one of that. Uh, key documents uh, since 1976 um, and remain an important uh, foundations for ASEAN and, and need to expand uh, core principles for ASEAN code of conduct for interstate relations among contracting parties, not just only in Southeast Asia, but beyond, because it's covered uh, uh, with uh, a lot of countries that accede to tax and become party that respect and adhere to the tax. So in so doing, it helped enhance strategic trust and, uh, and reduce the risk of your political confrontation and promote constructive and, and responsible com uh, competition and promote responsible competition between and among major powers. So um, this will also help enhance rule-based regional order. So this is another thing that ASEAN would uh, need to continue to promote uh, the, the rule-based and international uh, set of order that ASEAN has. The, and the last, uh, the final uh, thing is that ASEAN centrality, we always hear the, the word ASEAN centrality. ASEAN has earned and this kind of acceptance uh, for quite some time and we have worked to keep it uh, uh, to, to ensure that uh, we have made it a significant step to reaffirm that uh, the ASEAN centrality or ASEAN central regional architecture uh, with our principles, our practice and mechanisms will uh, be, be there and work uh, in, in such a way that will build and enhance trust and promote dialogue and cooperation and this will help ease tension and create opportunity and bring um, mutual benefit, mutual trust and respect. So uh, if this are the, the, the way that ASEAN can turn challenge into opportunities. Um, so uh, these are the, the, the challenge that I, I think of we, we have to deal with. And the Netherlands and the, as a partner, uh, uh, become parties to have can also be, have a great and constructive roles in, in, in helping us in, in, in such a way to promote multilateralism, uh, regionalism, group-based international order and collaboration in many practical areas. And uh, now I'll come to the second questions regarding the, uh, the, the Indo-Pacific uh, concept or strategies uh, we we uh, we have seen a number of uh, strategies that come out, and I think ASEAN uh, also, as we have our ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific, um, and this the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific based is based on ASEAN principles, interests, and priorities of cooperation. And one of the key uh, principles and values in, in ASEAN is that laid down in the uh, our paper outlook is inclusiveness or inclusivity. That is an important key principle that will help the outlook of ASEAN uh, to become the basic for us to be able to work as a platform for cooperation with other. Uh, strategies and to become a basis to building bridge and, and find possible link and synergies among various strategies. So it's mean that uh, 
with the various strategies that come out, there can be common uh, complementarity aspect or similarity that are ASEAN with the uh, the the positive outlooks and, and and inclusiveness inclusivity in its aspect. We can find a way uh, to work together with other strategies with it openness. For example, the air and the ASEAN outlook have uh, identified uh, areas of collaboration like maritime cooperation, connectivity, sustainable development, economic cooperation. Those are positive areas and, and open uh, for collaboration uh, through existing mechanisms. Uh, one possible, uh, one concrete example is that uh, ASEAN has uh, proceeded to think about the way to connect connecting connectivity. Uh, Ambassador Karen had mentioned uh, that uh, the, uh, the EU and the Netherlands have keen to work with us on the area of connectivity. ASEAN is also itself keen to work with other uh, partners uh, in the areas of connectivity, how to find synergy between the various already existing uh, connecting uh, connectivity strategies that we have. We have our ASEAN master plan and connectivity. We have the Belt and Road, we have the band partnership for infrastructure, and of course, the ASEAN strategic partnership. We can work together to find uh, the, the, the synergies on the connectivity area. This is uh, one concrete example. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, I have, um, for Ambassador Kari, I have one more quite interesting. Um, a question for you. This one is um, is a question by Nima Skurata Ayuni uh, from the Faculty of Law at Jambi University. The question is how far the third party like Netherlands can play the significant role in conflict resolution to pursue the peace in ASEAN. In ASEAN. Um, and another question is how to project Netherlands and ASEAN relations and cooperation in this um, new normal. You have the floor, man. Yeah. Thank you so much. And um, yes, I, and, it's, and those are very important questions, are very interesting questions as well. And uh, what I would like to say is that we, we stand ready to work together with ASEAN countries. Uh, to engage in, in, in dialogue and, and support wherever we can. And I think it is important that uh, we, uh, we work together in resolving uh, and, in a, and in a peaceful manner the, the uh, outstanding issues that are there, complex issues. We also work together and we like to work together with, uh, with experts from, uh, from for instance, uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, academic or uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the civil society world. Uh, we support initiatives from the Center for Human Humanitarian Dialogue in, in Singapore, for instance, who are doing very good work uh, in the region as well. Uh, and I think dialogue, as was mentioned also by the time, but sort of a very important word here. It is a key word. Uh, I think we need to engage in dialogue and if possible to facilitate in dialogues um, so to help uh, solve uh, the, uh, the issues of concern. But uh, uh, I think it is not, not something, of course, where we as in Netherlands can play uh, an, a, a, a role on our own. I mean, this is something where we can facilitate, or if, if asked, we can we can support. But dialogue is the key word here, I think, and making use of the, the expertise we have, of course, some expertise in in, in conflict resolution in um, in our ministry as well, and uh, and we always stand ready to to to, to engage with the experts in, in your countries to to work together to resolve these issues. But those are very important areas and I think we need to continue to work together in the, in the areas of peaceful settlement of conflicts. And then of course, there's the international law co component. We have, of course, as I said, a, a, a good basis here in The Hague as the ambassadors posted here now in the field of international law. Uh, and I think it's also very important if you want to settle uh, disputes um, uh, in a structural manner that, of course, everything is based and has a solid base in international law. 
and uh, there we can also help with capacity building, with uh, with uh, with, uh, with supporting with the, the the knowledge that we did we we have here or the, or the organizations based in the Hague. But that's uh, that's the long answer to this uh, very important uh, question. Thank you. Indeed, thank you very much, Ambassador Karim. Probably um, just I think I think that before we conclude the um, the the part um, for the spe speaker session, probably one last question raised by our participants here that I will um, I will direct to Ambassador Axel. Um, this question is from Handi Tarun Tarun Vijaya from the Faculty of Humanities and Business University, Indonesia. And his question is, what ASEAN could expect from the Netherlands new policy that was released recently that outlining a new strategy for the region and what makes it different from other similar policies that was made by other EU countries, such as France. You have to follow us, Justin. I'm so sorry. I couldn't hear you. Uh, could you kindly repeat the question again? The question is, uh, what ASEAN could expect from Netherlands new Indo-Pacific policy, um, which was released um, last, uh, the, the, which was released in July, I think, last year, and uh, and what makes it different from other similar policies that was um, released by other EU countries like France and Germany. I, I think I have uh, mentioned earlier uh, in, in answering the second questions regarding the, uh, the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, strategies um, <clears throat> that there are a number of, 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 of uh, strategies that come out and uh, we welcome uh, the, uh, the paper, the Dutch papers, which we saw uh, number of uh, complementarities and uh, uh, chair uh, principles that the Netherlands uh, see uh, have uh, in, in, in the paper without ASEAN uh, uh, paper as well uh, in, in terms of uh, openness and uh, rule-based uh, uh, respect to rule of laws and uh, and human rights and promotion of trade, investment, multilateral uh, order. I think uh, in that direction, and, and, and including uh, promotion of uh, sustainable development, uh, to name just a few. Uh, there are various areas that mentions uh, in quite a, a detail in, in the paper. Uh, and, and the data has also described uh, the way uh, the, the Netherlands will uh, uh, work closer in foster relationship with the like-minded countries in ASEAN, uh, not, uh, including ASEAN partners and bilaterally as well. Um, we will in in the areas of political securities, in the areas of uh, economic trade and and, and 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 sustainable development, which are which I mentioned earlier that it is, I could be in line complementary uh, with the ASEAN uh, for three pillars of ASEAN, uh, that is political securities, economic and social and, and, and cultural uh, communities uh, pillars. Um, so we will be welcome and, and look forward to, and with the ASEAN, uh, that, that, that is my uh, personal view on, on this. Uh, and, and we look for uh, the possibilities of, of greater collaborations, especially in, in the areas of uh, uh, expertise that the Netherlands has and, and, the, and, and mutual, mutual interest and, and, and expertise, which uh, have mentioned earlier by, by, by Ambassador Karen, and also um, I uh, have uh, also mentioned that uh, we welcome that, not just only trade investment, but area of uh, uh, the Dutch expertise is in particular the climate adaptations, 
and uh, 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 connectivities, those kind of areas which are in line with, with our uh, priorities ASEAN as well. And another area uh, that also mentioned by uh, Excellency uh, Lim Chok Hoi, also in the area of uh, um, mitigation, uh, uh, prevent, prevention and mitigation of pandemic, which is also an important uh, area uh, these days, in particular when we are facing with the uh, challenge of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the supporting of multilateral bodies like the WHO, the WTO, those are important uh, the issues that we can work together. So there are numerous opportunities, the, 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 the issues how and, and when and, and, and where to, to start with. Yeah. Really, thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, and thank you very much again, Ambassador uh, uh, Ayn Mosalakna, for both of your insightful. Maybe, 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 if you allow me, just one word on the question yes. what is the main difference between the, the, this, this strategy and, and, uh, and the strategies of the French and, 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 the, and the Germans? Because there are three European countries who've put a strategy on the table or a guideline on the table. I think in general, there's a lot of actually uh, similarity between the three approaches. And, uh, but I think the main difference is, I think that our, our stroke focuses strongest on the EU and also the ASEAN angle. We very much believe in the, the importance of this regional uh, also cooperation. Um, and uh, uh, the main focus of our paper was also to, uh, to get the discussion in the EU context going to make sure that we get the EU moving into, towards a more active approach towards the regional cooperation with the ASEAN. And we very much uh, are uh, well, uh, we're very much happy to, to notice that it has been put on the EU agenda. And it's very much on the ASEAN agenda as well. So we hope also through the, or, um, through the EU and ASEAN to enhance our cooperation in the, in the Pacific. Indeed, I, I believe that those papers will pave the way for a strengthening of relations between, um, between EU and ASEAN eventually. Um, yeah, again, uh, thank you very much, Ambassador uh, Karin uh, Mosalekna and Ambassador Axelie uh, Pintariki for your insightful point of view. Um, we are now have to move our session to uh, the next one, discussion uh, session. Today we have, um, as I have mentioned today, we have two um, distinguished um, uh, personalities um, who will, uh, who will uh, provide and share their wisdom as well. Uh, let me first um, invite uh, uh, Professor Ronald Holschaffer from the Groningen University of Groningen. You have the floor. Uh, professor, please. Dr. Yusuf, excellencies, thank you very much. You know, I wanted to start by um, saying good morning again to all of you across uh, the Netherlands and Europe, and good afternoon to all of the, our viewers from across Southeast Asia and the Asia Pacific. Um, when I look across um, the people that are participating online today, I see um, fellow faculty members um, that I've worked with in Southeast Asia, uh, many students, young, ma many young leaders that are playing an important role in their um, own societies and within uh, ASEAN. Today, we're here to reflect on and celebrate a new stage of relationship and engagement of the Netherlands with uh, ASEAN. The very first remarks this morning by the Netherlands Foreign Minister, Steph Bloch, and the ASEAN Secretary General, Dato Lim McCoy, I believe show a commitment that the Netherlands has really the two focuses both to ASEAN as a regional organization, but also to the 10 member states of ASEAN, and also as part of a broader engagement with the Indo-Pacific region as a whole. Relations between the European Union as a regional organization and ASEAN stretch back decades. In 1977, official dialogue 
relations began, and more recently, the EU has confirmed the adoption of a strategic uh, partnership. In 2017, the EU ASEAN Post Ministerial Conference also adopted the second EU ASEAN Plan of Action, 2018 2022. Um, so It'll be interesting to see now as this relationship moves forward and the new uh, agreement. I think it will be helpful to analyze and consider more deeply the implications of this new engagement with ASEAN and the member states. If we look at the um, uh, structure of ASEAN itself, Many of the speakers have mentioned the three pillars of ASEAN, the political security community, the economic community, and the socio-cultural community. Our question here for many of the viewers of, in the audience is the diplomatic door has now been opened and we need to ask ourselves, how can we engage the societies and institutions across Southeast Asia and the Netherlands to realize these ambitions of closer relations and deliver real results for a better future? In the area of the political security community, how can states reach out to civil society organizations to listen to concerns for preserving rule of law and human rights. Also where these are threatened in great moments of crisis, for example, now in Myanmar. In the area of the second ASEAN pillar, the economic community, how can the Netherlands and ASEAN bring together businesses to realize new opportunities? I recall a great convention a few years ago in The Hague organized by the countries from ASEAN with embassies in The Hague and the Dutch business organizations, VNO, NCW and MKB with hundreds of businesses wishing to find matching business partners across Southeast Asia. These kind of initiatives are critical for realizing this new diplomatic door, which has been opened. Finally, I wish to turn to the third ASEAN pillar, the socio-cultural pillar. Let me start with some of the fundamental ideas of this pillar and some of the pressing societal issues which ASEAN has identified that need broad societal engagement. Here are some of the words from the ASEAN Sociocultural Community Blueprint 2025, and I quote, at the heart of the sociocultural community is the commitment to lift the quality of life of its peoples through cooperative activities that are people-oriented, people-centered, environmentally friendly, and geared toward the promotion of sustainable development to face new and emerging challenges in ASEAN. The community is committed to opening a world of opportunities to collectively deliver and fully realizing human development, resiliency, and sustainable development through member states' cooperation on a wide range of areas, including culture and information, education, youth and sports, health, social welfare and development, women and gender, rights of the women and children, labor, civil service, rural development, poverty eradication, environment, transboundary haze pollution, disaster management and humanitarian assistance, unquote. These are critical issues. Many of these issues are strongly related to the Global Goals 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. Many of these areas are also of great interest and importance to the Netherlands. I wish to highlight some of the uh, statements from the request for a session that was sent by the Netherlands Foreign Minister, Steph Block to ASEAN, to ASEAN, which underline areas of cooperation related to climate and sustainable development. And I quote, the Netherlands would like to engage in broader and deeper cooperation with the states of Southeast Asia on shared challenges like climate change and the sustainable development goals. 
The Netherlands and the states of Southeast Asia have a lot to offer each other when it comes to climate adaptation measures. Um, earlier this year, and it was something um, that uh, Karen Mosen-Lechner uh, mentioned earlier, um, the Dutch government uh, planned the Global Climate Adaptation Summit. Um, here in Groningen on the morning of the conference, our Seassian Center also organized a conference on climate change and sustainable development in the Asia Pacific with scholars uh, both from the Netherlands and Southeast Asia, from Singapore, Indonesia, and Malaysia. So we first focused on the scientific debate. Next, we turned to implementation of climate adaptation measures, specifically in the area of, of flooding. And uh, we focused on Indonesia and Thailand. And finally, we closed with the political and policy implications of climate and sustainable development. The final session included the Vietnam ambassador to the Netherlands, His Excellency Pham Thi An, reflecting on the Vietnam presidency of ASEAN 2020. Uh, also, um, um, a speaker was our Netherlands Ministry of Infrastructure and Water, Cora van Nieuwenhuizen. So I think this is important to mention that, you know, we're hearing today from the foreign ministry, but this is a really a whole of government approach and a whole of society approach in this new relations between the Netherlands and ASEAN and Southeast Asia. In this area of um, uh, cultural uh, exchange, I think it's important that universities across Europe and ASEAN and in our classrooms and in our research, we build on these political and diplomatic openings to show our determination and great value in assisting this process of bringing the peoples of this region even more closely together. The social relevance of universities and knowledge institutions could be no greater than it is today, especially in the areas of climate, health, and sustainable development. The EU and ASEAN have um, established a joint research funding program. Um, um, these uh, programs could be expanded and there are existing exchange programs, for example, the SHARE program. Um, the SHARE program by EU and ASEAN was designed to strengthen cooperation and enhance the quality, regional competitiveness, and internationalization of ASEAN higher education institutions and students. So many of the listeners today try to look at the SHARE uh, program, and once our societies begin to open up again, it's an opportunity for uh, exchange. Beyond our knowledge institutes and universities focused on highly relevant societal research, teaching and outreach, it's important to explore other uh, uh, cultural uh, actors. We need to think about how to bring together our museums, the visual arts, dance and music. What kind of popular cultural and food festival of Southeast Asia could we put on in a number of cities across the Netherlands in the summer? Or what Dutch event in Southeast Asia could we do to bring together a broad uh, spectrum of the public? Thus, the emphasis that I wanted to place here is this great diplomatic door has been opened between the Netherlands and ASEAN, and now it's time for our societies and other kinds of institutions also to walk through this door and realize the vision that has been laid out here. So thank you very much. Can, can, can enter and benefit the two parties, certainly. Um, uh, now it is uh, uh, the, the, the time for me to call for Dr. Fifi to 
to share to share points of to, to share points of view. You have to follow the people. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Hisham, um, for the opportunity. Um, I'd like to uh, begin by um, expressing my greatest appreciation for the um, ASEAN Committee in the Hague for organizing, I think, this very important um, webinar today, I think this very important discussion um, on this issue. Uh, I'd like to personally thank uh, Ambassador Meyer Fass and um, the Indonesian um, uh, Embassy uh, in The Hague for the kind invitation for me to, to join this discussion. Um, I feel very privileged uh, to, to listen to all the um, experts speaking on this issue and I'm, uh, I've been learning a lot since the past two hours or so. So, so, so thank you again for this. Um, as I said, I've been really enjoying um, listening to all the, the remarks uh, made today um, you know, from Ambassador Meyerfass and then from Minister Glock and then from um, SG Lim Jokhoi and uh, also our two speakers. Uh, and always the challenge of being the last to speak, um, everything's been said. Uh, everyone else has been, has um, expressed the views um, very eloquently uh, about the importance uh, of uh, this uh, accession of Netherlands to the TAC, uh, the good relations uh, between the Netherlands uh, and ASEAN, uh, and there have been a long list, a very a long list of you know possible areas of cooperation that uh, both the Netherlands and Africa can do uh, after you know after this um, using the, the expression used by uh, Professor Mon earlier, this deep door um, has been opened. So now um, we can all already you know do a lot of um, um, efforts um, to actually allow this uh, for closer cooperation to happen. So um, I, I was thinking that um, I really don't want to repeat um, all of the uh, important um, information that has been shared. Um, sorry, is my voice um, is good? Yes, good. Is it good? Okay, thank you. Yes, good. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I really don't don't want to uh, repeat all of the important um, statements that have been made. So um, I was thinking that I would. Um, try to um, present like a, a different angle or a different take to the issue because I believe, um, I think all of us agree that this is an important event, that uh, it's time for a closer, closer cooperation between, in general, Southeast Asia and Europe, um, looking at the different challenge, uh, the, the similar, the common challenges that we have. Uh, but at the same time, um, this is not happening in a, in a vacuum situation because the world is also changing. Um, ASEAN was established in 1967, the TAC came into effect in 1976. Um, Netherlands relations with Southeast Asian nations uh, have existed way before that even. Um, so all of these traditions um, and, and this, this great importance have been built for a long time. But I do think that now uh, we live in a world where there are um, uh, different challenges uh, and there are new dynamics of, of geopolitics that govern uh, how nations uh, uh, relate to the other. So um, if I may, I'm going to share some slides just to uh, introduce um, some, uh, I think some uh, uh, some things that might uh, you might find a little bit maybe interesting to start off the discussion. Okay, first, um, I think I'll start with um, with some quotations. I think um, this I think more or less describe the world that we are living now. Um, you know, more powers distributed among players. However, at the same time, there is apparent trust deficit among countries. Therefore, you know, always even within ASEAN, consensus is harder to achieve. That's something I think we have to admit. Uh, the second quotation, I think uh, I get this from multiple sources, more or less saying the same thing, but talking specifically about ASEAN and the role of ASEAN uh, that it has, it has played so far, and uh, specifically about the TAC, you know, in the past, larger powers used to force the small countries to sign peace treaties, but now, you know, with ASEAN, larger powers join ASEAN's Treaty of Amity and Cooperation on their own initiative to take part in providing security assurance in the region. So we see, you know, that there are two different dynamics going on here. At the same time, um, cooperation is somewhat harder to achieve with the uh, current trend for competition. But at the same time, you know, uh, uh, um, um, there are um, serious efforts uh, that countries try to work together in providing security assurances 
in different regions of the world. So there are um, two different kinds of dynamic. Um, next, why don't we um, why don't we take a look at um, you know uh, the the trend, uh, the global trend at the moment. Um, you see, you know, different. Um, you read the news. You see different um, surveys and everything. It seems that there are now diminishing multilateralism, which is a very, you know, negative downward trend. Uh, what are the symptoms? There is lack of global leadership. Uh, there are now more populist policies. There are now more breakthrough via bilateral and minilateral channels. And now there is diminishing trust towards multilateral frameworks. Uh, and unfortunately, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has heightened all of this um, uh, diminishing trend um, of multilateralism. You see big countries exiting from uh, existing multilateral frameworks. Um, uh, important multilateral institutions such as WHO has been criticized for its handling of the, of the pandemic. There are competition, fierce competition in getting vaccine. Um, states uh, are becoming more and more populous. Everything is about, you know, their own self-interest. So these are all, you know, the, the trend that we are that is happening right now. You know, and looking at this condition, then the big question is, you know, how do we forge cooperation? If the Netherlands and ASEAN really want to strengthen their existing um, level of cooperation, you know, with with the TAC and all, uh, you know, how do they do it? You know, in in uh, amidst this global trend of diminishing multilateralism, can we actually go against the current? So um, let me also quote. Um, there are some uh, some um, recent polls showing. However, there is still, you know, positive public opinion going on, you know, so even though uh, at the state level, there are uh, these trends that I said about, you know, populist policies and so on. However, re recent polls also show that from the public opinion, there is still a uh, positive um, sentiments. Uh, the survey from Pew Research Center say that, you know, uh, there are still positive views regarding the United Nations, which means that there is still very high trust uh, towards multilateral frameworks. Um, CSIS Indonesia, uh, where I work, uh, we did a survey, a public uh, an elite um, survey uh, last year, uh, you know, in the midst of the pandemic, uh, asking uh, various types of questions, uh, you know, how, do, how the elite views this changing to the global order. And so, mm -hmm. you know, um, so even though there are pessimism, um, there is still a little bit of optimism saying that okay, this trend exists, this uh, trend uh, towards diminishing multilateralism exists, but it's only temporary because there is crisis, because there is, um, you know, uh, the, the leadership uh, of, uh, in, the, uh, within the big countries such as, uh, you know, the, uh, in the US and so on. So even though it, it, it exists, the trend exists, it's only temporary. So there is still hope for the future. Uh, another question we also ask is that, you know, uh, how would you describe the potential global leadership of the following international organization, and ASEAN is uh, included in the survey, you know, in the post COVID-19 global order. So, you know, it's still very positive, you know, positive and very positive towards, you know, ASEAN and institution, the European Union, uh, G20, G7, which means that, you know, there is still a very high level of trust uh, among the public towards uh, multilateral. And I think not only trust, there is also this great expectation that, you know, uh, international cooperation will actually help um, countries get out of the crisis that we are in right now with regards to the pandemic. So um, with, you know, with this trend, um, we see that, you know, Southeast Asia and Europe, um, these two are actually proponents of multilateral cooperation, ASEAN and its regional architectures with the ASEAN Regional Forum, ASEAN Plus Three, now the East Asia, East Asia Summit, uh, and European Union also with its intra-regional and trans-regional uh, forum. So, um, this, you know, all of this uh, different um, efforts, you know, it's basically, uh, uh, you can see it as a hedging and balancing strategy, which has so far, you know, um, benefit both um, Southeast Asia and, and also Europe. Now the buzzword uh, is Indo-Pacific, and I think this is also very relevant um, to our discussion today. And I think this was um, uh, also uh, touched upon by uh, by the previous speakers and also uh, in the questions um, uh, chat box, I see that a lot of people are also interested in this work because this is, 
you know, you like it or not, is this a new buzzword everybody's saying about Indo-Pacific? Uh, more and more countries are um, issuing their, um, uh, what do you call it, their, their, their outlook, their strategy, uh, their paper on, on Indo-Pacific. But, you know, there's still a lot of confusion towards this, um, you have to admit. Is it a concept? Some people call it a strategy. Like I said, ASEAN calls it an outlook on Indo-Pacific. There is some countries call it a guideline uh, in Indo-Pacific. And there's also a confusion, you know, what, what do we mean when we say Indo-Pacific? Do, do we want to create a new institution uh, comprising of all the states in the Indo-Pacific? Or do we want to define a certain geographical limit, you know, when, when we say Indo-Pacific? Now, aside from this, um, all of these questions, uh, one thing is for sure, I think, uh, which uh, this is um, Indo-Pacific means an opportunity for closer cooperation. And for Southeast Asian countries, for, for ASEAN, being at the heart of the uh, in, in the Pacific, uh, it's really an opportunity for it to create closer cooperation with a lot of countries um, and and other countries, uh, you know, um, seeing in the Pacific is now the place uh, where, you know, for, for development and prosperity, then a lot of countries would want to join in uh, and, you know, become uh, maybe not in geographical definition part of Indo-Pacific, but, uh, you know, join uh, Indo-Pacific in terms of, you know, being an active player, being a, a player with a key role in defining how uh, international relations should be like. So I think this is this is the opportunity for, for, for this closer cooperation between, between ASEAN and, and the Netherlands. Um, so next, you know, um, I'll spend a little bit on, on also uh, the, the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. We talked a lot about this. Uh, the previous speakers uh, uh, described um, TAC to great uh, details. And I think um, I, I also learned from, from, from their statements. Uh, but for, you know, for ASEAN, for us in Southeast Asia, what does it mean? Uh, you know, I think the, the, the number one keyword for this should be it's a symbol of trust towards ASEAN. Um, uh, not only within uh, the Southeast Asian countries, but also from, you know, from its external partners. ASEAN uh, will cease to matter once it loses trust from its external partners. So that's why, you know, this TAC means a lot. In a world where, you know, sometimes people say norms don't matter, um, realistic policies, those are all that matters. Um, you know, things like TAC is, is creates a symbol of trust towards um, ASEAN specifically, but I think towards, you know, cooperation and in general. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a balancing strategy. And I think um, for, for countries, I think like for uh, a lot of um, Southeast Asian countries, it's basically small and middle power diplomacy. You know, uh, small and middle powers, um, you know, it's, it's really difficult to try to fight for your interests on your own. But small and middle power diplomacy, when you band together, creating a, a, a group like ASEAN and then, you know, create a, gaining trust from external partners, that's where it matters. The next question is, does TAC still relevant or is TAC still relevant? In 1976, it's, it was a norm based code of conduct for regional interstate relations. Now, it's a code to carry out relations uh, intra and extra region. So it's signed by non-ASEAN countries, meaning that it attributes, uh, has been accepted beyond Southeast Asia. Uh, and I think for, for ASEAN also what matters the most is that the core, it, the TAC is basically the core of ASEAN's attempt to establish a security community in, in Southeast Asia. Um, so what is ASEAN's expectation? Um, you know, external countries, uh, okay, TAC is still very relevant for, for, for ASEAN, but what is ASEAN expectation when countries want to accede to TAC? This is, I think, the big question here. Um, you know, is it true that the more the merrier for TAC? Uh, is it true that ASEAN wants um, as many countries as possible to accede to, to, to the TAC? Um, th there are several expectations, I think, coming from, from Southeast Asia. Uh, um, basically, you know, um, it means that, you know, uh, it invites accommodative foreign policy of other states towards Southeast Asian states and ASEAN. 
um, you know, dealing with countries uh, before TAC is, 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 uh, is, of course, very different. And I think this was shown the most, uh, I think, when China acceded, um, signed the TAC and acceded to it, and how, you know, the different types of, of relations then uh, occurred between um, uh, ASEAN states and China. Uh, it allows Southeast Asian countries uh, to partly redefine their relation with external partners, and I think that's important. I think this is also related to the small and middle power diplomacy, as I mentioned. Uh, it, it's also, you know, ASEAN, when other countries accede to TAC, for ASEAN it means a means to respond and adjust to the security dynamics within and surrounding Southeast Asia. Like I said, you know, ASEAN cannot exist on its own. Uh, and again, it means having a higher stance in conducting external relations. So, you know, there, there are these expectations uh, that ASEAN might have, you know, when, when, when other countries accede to TAC. And I think um, my last point should be, and I think this was, um, I don't want to add to this list because the previous speakers have, add, have made a very long list of, you know, areas of cooperation. The TAC, you know, usually divides it into stability and security and promoting prosperity. Um, and there is a very long list. And because uh, the Netherlands and Southeast Asia have had a very long history of cooperation, there already ex exists you know, uh, a long list of areas of cooperation. And I think the challenge here is actually prioritizing. You know, what makes the difference between before TAC and after TAC? You know, th there has to be a priority, you know, uh, a, a real definition of you know, this before and after. And I think uh, without this clear prioritizing, we might actually be missing the boat, you know, when, when this door has already been opened. Uh, and I think that the, the, the real challenge is actually for, for both uh, sides, the Netherlands and ASEAN, to actually uh, be able to create um, uh, this, uh, this prioritizing of, of, uh, of, um, yeah, of uh, areas of cooperation. So um, I think um, I'll end my, my remarks here. I look forward to further uh, discussion and, and answering questions from the audience. Thank you so much. Dr. Fifi, for a very lengthy, comprehensive and sweet uh, point of view just now. Um, now we, we, we are now entering the, uh, the Q&A session. Let me first... Uh, Okay, let me first um, ask Professor Ron one question. From my, the question is uh, from the perspective of non state actor, how will the grassroots in the Netherlands understand enough about ASEAN and the strategic for, importance of ASEAN uh, for the Netherlands? What more can be done or what should be done differently to strengthen the first? the posturing of ASEAN among the Dutch people and facilitate more meaningful people-to-people -people contact between the two, the, the Netherlands. Yes, thank you so much for the, the question. You know, I think that there are numerous actors that have responsibilities here. I think you know, the Dutch government, once the whole legal process is completed and the accession to the treaty is uh, finished, then is to uh, make sure that this is uh, promoted within a Dutch society, that we are deepening our relationship um, with uh, all of Southeast Asia, and also that this is embedded within our larger strategy of our role within the EU, and how that will, um, and that the Netherlands will be encouraging greater interaction between the European Union and uh, ASEAN. I think within our university programs, we need to make sure that um, we embed the study of, of Southeast Asia in many of our different programs and in international relations and spatial sciences. Um, that's been a special focus that, uh, that I have here at the University of Groningen. Um, I also think that 
different kinds of civil society organizations, you know, environmental organizations that are um, used to linking the Netherlands and EU policy need to also think about, okay, how can they be engaged globally on issues of, of climate change and the environment? Um, and, you know, finally, I mentioned this diplomatic door, I think is open now to, um, museums, cultural institutions. I want to see a blossoming of a uh, cultural celebration between these, uh, these the, the different societies. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ram. Um, for Dr. Titi, let me just fire one short question first and then we can continue later on. Um, the question is whether, uh, do you think how if, uh, how effective and relevant TAC is in achieving its objectives of perpetual peace in the wider regional surrounding of ASEAN, which include the greater Indo-Pacific, you have to follow, uh, Dr. D.C. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the question. Um, I think, you know, um, it's, it's TAC is one of the means for, for ASEAN to actually solidify its relations with external partners. So um, in terms of the TAC itself, um, you know, as a treaty itself being, being relevant, it cannot stand on its own. Um, a, a TAC, I think uh, it's, it's a very uh, important document, um, you know, outlining um, uh, all of these ideas that, you know, ASEAN wishes to work together with certain countries in terms of you know maintaining peace and stability and also uh, promoting prosperity, but all the activities you know um, be it you know uh, upholding security and the cooperation uh, in response towards um, uh, combating non traditional security threats, for example, that is not regulated solely by the TAC, but it's more like the TAC. You see it as a I, as I mentioned, it's a symbol of trust, uh, and I think. It's it's the point where you know the, the, the ASEAN and external and its external partner uh, really decide and the, the, this is uh, to embarking on a closer uh, cooperation. So you can't really uh, judge the TAC on its own on its being relevant or not because the 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 the, the cooperation uh, between the two partners should uh, be you know uh, a lot more than just uh, the treaty itself. Thank you so much. Uh... Dr. Titi, um, there is uh, one particular question. I think um, this must be coming from one of your students, uh, Professor Ram, uh, from Diani Rasmi Tasari. And uh, she asked a question uh, about what role can the EU may take to collaborate with ASEAN to strengthen the ASEAN Intergovern Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights? Uh, functions related to the crisis in in, in one uh, in Myanmar uh, recently. Do you mind? Do, do you mind to to approach that? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, uh, yes, Diane, one of my uh, PhD candidates, um, and she is part of the um, National Ombudsman Office in uh, Indonesia. Um, I think that uh, AICHER and this um, human rights institution within ASEAN is, is a very important place where discussions uh, on human rights across all 10 member states can uh, occur. Um, one of the contributors to our latest book on challenges of governance, development of regional integration in Southeast Asia and ASEAN, um, has a contribution by the Indonesian representative to uh, Aicher, Yuyun Wagengrum. And um, she talks about how over time there's been a strengthening of the role of uh, Aicher in ASEAN and human rights. And she also has played a strong role in linking different civil society organizations across that can be also engaged in Myanmar. You know, one of the, um, when, you know, when we think about the pillar structure of ASEAN, um, 
And there's always a lot of focus, of course, on the economic community. And I always say when, for example, the Indonesian foreign minister, Retno Marsudi, traveled to Myanmar to talk about the um, uh, Rakhine state um, and the Rohingya, that, you know, that journey, I think, was also possible because of the strong economic ties within ASEAN. And then Indonesia said, we're also going to be talking about uh, human rights violations then uh, that are faced by the Rohingya. So um, I think that that dialogue within ASEAN and human rights is, is quite important and will continue. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Long. Probably the same question to, to Dr. Fifi, but with a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, a little bit of spices here. Um, I take this question from Handi Tanwijaya, um, and he asked that what ASEAN could expect from the Netherlands new policy? Oh, sorry. Uh, I think, sorry. Um, the question is from Bakus Hadi, Hadi Redjo. I, I did um, ask the question from Handi just now. And um, the question is, with the current geopolitical shift in Myanmar, how should the ASEAN member states and contracting high contracting parties to the TAC approach to the so-called principle of inter non-intervention? And to what extent is necessary to re-evaluate the TAC and subsequently man the treaty? Um, we have to follow. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hisham, uh, and thank you for, for the question as well. Um, it's it's always difficult when, when we discuss about the principle of non-intervention uh, and when we, you know, when we are um, in a, in a uh, condition where there are issues uh, as the, 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 the queen, uh, the, the problem in Myanmar, then, um, you know, it becomes even more um, uh, uh, complex to discuss about the principle of non-intervention. That's one of the ASEAN principles that have been highly criticized, you know, the non-intervention, why we have it. Uh, how, how is it still relevant uh, in the world that we are now and so on. But I also think at the same time that, you know, non-intervention is what makes ASEAN um, exist until now. It's one of the, it's one of the principles that really forms uh, the backbone of, of the association that the 10 states, the 10 countries are, um, uh, are willing to, to, to work together, um, you know, uh, through different types of um, um, challenges and, and problems. Uh, and I think, you know, um, um, uh, the, the, for, for, for ASEAN countries themselves, you know, uh, not mentioning um, um, uh, the other parties there to, the, to the TAC, uh, I think it's it's uh, it's really complex issues when we want to wish to you know discuss about reevaluating uh, um, some of the principles and so on because then you question the whole the whole existence um, of of the association itself um, and I think um, you know um, uh, there are um, um, different um, principles that that ASEAN upholds uh, and the, the non intervention um, is part of it. Um, and it's, I think it's, you know, looking at, uh, at the current um, situation in, 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 in Southeast Asia, I think it's, it's a little bit too early to talk about the necessity to actually evaluate um, some of the, the, the points or the principles mentioned uh, in the TAC. So I don't really see it happening uh, in the near future. The next question is to be shared um, between uh, Professor Ron and Dr. Fiki. Uh, how to project Netherlands and ASEAN relations in, in cooperation in the new normal? Uh, probably Dr. Professor Ron can, can, can start answering. You know, I, wonder, I think we all wonder and hope what the new normal is going to consist of. Um, <laughs> You know, in the last week here in, in the Netherlands, we saw so many people outside and so many families uh, ice skating. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, we dream about being able to also, you know, reestablish our ties in uh, sunny Southeast Asia in warmer climates. Um, so I think that that is 
quite difficult to know what the new normal is going to be. You know, I did want to make a further comment about the discussion today about the Netherlands policy embedded in, um, in the Indo-Pacific statement. And I think it's also important to uh, that this Indo-Pacific policy is also embedded in the transatlantic relations of the Netherlands and of Europe with the United States. We have a new administration with President Biden and Anthony Blinken, the new Secretary of State, has also really spoken about this new emphasis on the um, Indo-Pacific. Um, and I think, again, this is an opportunity for you know, the independence of Southeast Asia, so that there is a balancing of great power uh, interests, China, Europe, the United States, and that gives Southeast Asia a great space for independence because there's multiple, you know, great powers uh, around and are um, back again, interested and focused on the, on the region. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Professor Brown. Probably one more question for Dr. Hiki. We have been talking about uh, the expectation from the dark term um, uh, session to PVC, but we have yet to learn comprehensively about uh, what can ASEAN offer to the Netherlands? That's a very interesting question, uh, Dr. Hisham, and I think a, a very valid one um, um, to ask, basically. Um, um, I, I, it's, and I think it's fair to ask because um, in my presentation, I talked about, you know, ASEAN's expectation. Um, and I think um, it's, it's, it's only fair that we also question, you know, what does ASEAN have to offer, you know, not only to the Netherlands, but to all the, uh, you know, the, the partners that are, um, that are um, signing the, the TAC, you know, what, what is it that, that, that makes TAC uh, an interesting um, treaty, you know, what ASEAN has to offer, um, you know, but the, I think the question, the answer to that uh, um, also changes with the dynamics of, of, of of the geopolitics of international relations, I think. The answer might be different uh, in the 1970s, in the 1980s, in the 1990s, and now, I think with, with our current condition, with the situation of the world that we are in now. Um, and I think the, the, the answer to that now should relate uh, a lot about what uh, I mentioned about the new buzzword of Indo-Pacific and how ASEAN is at the heart of this, uh, this Indo-Pacific, whether you see it as a geopolitic, uh, as a geographical, um, area, or you see it as uh, more as an uh, an effort for uh, cooperation towards um, uh, in terms of security and also economic cooperation. Whether you like it or not, uh, Indo Pacific is there, and it's acknowledged that um, as you know, uh, as as the area of cooperation that is the most important now, and th that explains the reasons why more and more countries are uh, you know are buying into this this new terminology, and more and more country is 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 putting up documents. Uh, outlining their, you know, their outlook, their strategy, whatever you want to call it on Indo-Pacific. And I think this is something that, you know, uh, ASEAN should um, actually take, well, take advantage of basically, you know, um, uh, with the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific, uh, there are already, you know, uh, a number of areas of cooperation, uh, the, the maritime cooperation, um, development cooperation, you know, it's already listed there in the, in the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific. And I think it's it's time for ASEAN to actually um, make this outlook uh, as a document that is workable when it wants to engage with external partners. You know, uh, from all of these um, areas of cooperation, which uh, you know, which partners do you want to deal with uh, in actually trying to realize the important points of the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific? So um, I think this is the this is time for for ASEAN to actually um, um, make the most of of this new buzzword of Indo-Pacific. Okay, thank you very much for the for the answer. I have now, I believe that I have exhausted with the questions. Um, but then uh, before we end our session today, I'd like to once again invite uh, Professor uh, Ron um, to conclude um, your your session. Please, you have the floor, Professor. Yes, I. 
you know, also just wanted to thank all of our viewers from uh, across Europe and Southeast Asia and Indo-Pacific uh, to, to join us today. Um, perhaps some of the, uh, the earlier speakers, I mean, all the questions weren't necessarily just for us as the commentators, but our role was really to provide some commentary to, to what the um, uh, other speakers, so perhaps I let um, some of the other dignitaries also um, uh, conclude with their impressions of the different viewpoints that we've had. I guess one of the, you know, the, to your earlier question about what does ASEAN and Southeast Asia offer to uh, Europe, and I think one of the messages there is increasingly we realize we are all in one world together. There's one COVID, we're one human species, we have a set of vaccines that we need to share across the world. Um, the climate is, you know, whatever gets polluted in Europe or the United States or China or Southeast Asia affects us all. Um, we are all care deeply about sustainable development, poverty, hunger, making sure everybody gets educated. Um, so the, this tack is within a larger realization that we really have experienced this past year. We're all in the same boat together and we need to continue in all kinds of institutions, nation states and cities and museums and universities and civil society that um, this unity and keeping peace and uh, respect for individual human dignity, those are universal values. And we're really seeing that in the past year. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, um, uh, Professor uh, Ron Holschata. Now over to you, um, Dr. Viti, for your summary and, and conclusion, please. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hisham. I think Professor uh, Holzhacker already summed up uh, perfectly, you know, the, the some of the important points that we have uh, discussed today. Um, but I think I, I'd like just to um, uh, underline um, one important thing, and I think it's 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 mentioned here and there. And I think um, also because we're realizing um, uh, the current situation we have, we are right now with the pandemic. Uh, I think you know health cooperation remains um, at the top of the minds of all countries um, at the moment. Uh, whether it's you know mit mitigating uh, the pandemic itself, uh, cooperation with regards to the vaccine, uh, and also efforts for um, economic recovery, uh, and I think it's a it's a concern to a lot of people that the pandemic is actually highlighting a lot of the competition aspect of international relations and not the cooperation um, aspect. So I think this is something that uh, you know needs uh, to be underlined over and over again. So that you know, uh, we're already uh, facing competition with regards to you know um, responding to the to, to COVID nineteen. Uh, I really hope that we don't uh, see the same level of competition when we are all in the efforts for economic recovery. Thank you so much, Dr. Fishan. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Fifi. Uh, now I believe that uh, now the door is now widely open, and time for us to ensure that 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 overarching uh, cooperation between the two parties will uh, should now begin and, and, and intensify. Uh, then I think I believe that our discussion today is now over. I'd like to uh, return the session to our master's, master's ceremony. Over to you, sir. Okay. Uh... Uh, thank you, Dr. Isham, uh, dear uh, Excellencies, uh, distinguished participants. We just uh, witnessed a very uh, interesting discussion uh, uh, between uh, all speakers and the uh, partner. Now, allow us to uh, uh, read the a closing statement. Uh, my, my, uh, the Ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia, Myanmar. Uh, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia will uh, will read a conclude, uh, concluding statement. Uh, yeah, closing statement. Sorry. Closing statement. Uh,
Excellencies, distinguished participants, it has been a great day for all of us to listen to our speakers' discussions. I would like to thank you. I would like to thank our distinguished speakers, His Excellency Step Block, for his video message. His Excellency uh, Dato Lim Chokhoi for his key remark and for Her Excellency Karin Mosen Lechner and Her Excellency Exiri Pitarucci for their kind thought and sharing on today's theme. Appreciation, of course, also goes to our discussion, Dr. Safiya Muhibat and Professor Ronald Horst Hacker in enlightening our topic and to Dr. Muhammad Nur Hisham bin Muhammad Yusuf for moderating this event. And of course, to our value participant, I thank you all for your time in joining us. And I hope you have learned so much, so many things about the Netherlands accession to TSC and cooperation in in this Southeast Asia. A state by Prime Minister Makrute at a meeting of the foreign policy community of Indonesia last October 2019, they agreed a shared outlook on Indo-Pacific cooperation and treaties such as what we are having only shows the ambitions of a region that is seeking to boost coordination and cooperation based on international rules to solidify trust toward ensuring a relative peace. The Netherlands do has long-standing ties with Southeast Asia. We already work together in many areas and we are also united on many international issues. The EU ASEAN strategic partnership that, that was agreed last year is an excellent basis for working together. We share the words that we should combine our power, powerful force because we, by standing side by side, we can truly make our voices heard at the global level. In a figure of speech by His Excellency Steph Block, ASEAN member state and the Netherlands stand ready to work together, just like the regional sport of Sepak Takraw. I hope that in the future, cooperation by both ASEAN and the Netherlands will bloom beautifully, like tulip in the, in the springtime. And everyone, I believe, will flock to see them and tell stories out of it. Thank you once again. Terima kasih. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Excellency Ambassador Mayorkot. Uh, and uh, this is participants, and with that, we have come to the end of our webinar. Once again, we would like to highly appreciate all Excellencies, speakers, discussants, and all participants that have made their time available to participate in this event today. Uh, we received a lot of requests to, because of the interest in the discussion, we received a lot of requests whether the recording of this session can be shared. Uh, Happily, with your permission, uh, I'm happy to share that this discussion will be uploaded to the YouTube channel of the embassy. Uh, it is the kindly search KBRI Den Haag, that is Kilo Bravo Romeo India, KBRI Den Haag, in the YouTube, should you want to access these uh, discussions later on. Once again, uh, thank you for your participation today. We wish you all the best of things. Uh, stay healthy. And say, oh, uh, once again, uh, sorry, um, we have uh, also we have uh, sent our the attendance list in the chat box. So please, those who has not yet filled it, please uh, fill accordingly. Thank you once again. Bye bye.